Good afternoon, uh, brothers and sisters in the Dhamma. Welcome to Buddhist Fellowship's uh, launch of our website, as well as uh, Ajahn Brahm's talk on apathy versus equanimity. Before we start, let us pay respects to the Triple Gem. Arahang Samma Sambuddho Bhagawa Buddhang Bhagawantang Abhiwademi Swakato Bhagawata Dhammo Dhammang Namasami Supatipano Bhagavato Sawakasango Sangang Namami Thank you. Today we won't do the whole puja as we are short of time. Okay, welcome again to our uh, exciting update to, for today. Uh, let us uh, let me remind those who are here to turn off their mobile phones. Thank you so much. And uh, to keep your mask on at all times and safe distancing as well. And welcome to those who are on Facebook. Um, we shall start soon. Let me go to the agenda. Okay, today we are launching not only our donation drive, official launch, but also our, our Dhamma Home website. So um, at 2.05, we will have update of the new building and fundraising efforts by Brother Pang Hong. And then rough uh, gauge of 2.25, we have an uh, uh, update by Brother Tairi on the intro to the new website. And then 2.45, we welcome Ajahn uh, to uh, our room and Brother Pang Hong will give him a summary of what has been happening. And 2.55, we will invite Ajahn to say a few words as well as maybe offer a blessing for our success. And at 3 o'clock, we will do a countdown of the official launch of the new website followed by Ajahn's talk. Okay, I will hand over to Brother Pang Hong. Thank you. Of a background to why we are here today. Biff has a vision to build a fellowship of strong Dharma practitioners. And the mission that we have set ourselves is to build our home and to lift the Dharma in everything we do. And so I think this is an important part to, to keep at the back of our minds as we go through the rest of the uh, slides uh, and also to look at the fundraising efforts we are looking to do. So in service of that, what we look to do for BF, uh, and this has actually been the case for the last you know uh, 30 years now. So. We offer a Dharma education, community service, and fellowship. So as you all know, uh, these are things that you can look forward to uh, experiencing when you come to a talk at BF on the Sundays or other days of the week. And uh, we have a lot of other activities. So I'll just do a quick cap of what we just to show because unfortunately, we've been living under the COVID environment for about you know, a year and a half now. So, um, so it's hard to think back of the pre-COVID days. So this was the situation before you know, we went through a series of shutdowns. And, and it's, I, I think this is something that we are looking to do uh, going forward. As we all know, uh, the Singapore government is essentially you know, think, saying that this is an endemic and not a pandemic. And so therefore we have to go back to life as normal at some stage. And so it's useful to see what is it that we had, uh, BF has offered to members uh, throughout the years. So we have a Sunday Dhamma talks, we have a Dhamma sharings by uh, speakers, uh, Sangha, both Sangha and lay speakers, the Dhamma Dutta programs for junior, junior youth and youth, 
uh, retreats, if you remember them. <laughs> okay, we had we organized a lot of them, uh, and I think this is something we're looking forward to to coming back. Pilgrimages, talks, and courses. We have uh, subgroups uh, like the PROs, the yellow shirts, if you like, that you see around when you come and visit. These are volunteers who are very dedicated, and they are you know around to make sure um, all your all your needs in the in BF are met. Indonesian group uh, have their own service in Bahasa, Indonesia. Uh, the ECG, this Ahipasi Chanting group, essentially looking at, at uh, helping out at the wakes uh, to help the bereaved. Uh, Based on support, we tried to, uh, to start it off, but unfortunately it got uh, curtailed by the COVID situation for obvious points. Uh, community service, we were very active at, uh, with Prof. Uh, Gilang East Home for the Aged, Renshu, the Prison Mission uh, Interfaith, IRCC. At the same time, you know, we understand that the, you know, in addition to the mind, we also have to take care of the, the body. So the health and wellness activities, uh, yin yoga, tai chi, happy workout, are very, very uh, uh, popular on, on the days. And of course, the home affairs, right? Why we come by to BF on Sunday, potluck lunch, you know, and we were going to grow green initiative as well. Where we help each other out. So, so I spend a bit of time on this to just to get uh, set the stage so that uh, you know these are the things that we're looking to do once we have the, the 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 new place that we're talking about. So this is very useful to think about. And the reason for this is also because a bit of a history, and you will get a bit more perspective later. Uh, we have been moving around quite a fair bit. BFS uh, started Taipei, uh, went to Taipei, uh, rather, and then went to the Burmese Buddhist Temple, Pekchuan Building, uh, and so on and so forth, Geelang, Itan, Persian, Shpur, and then with Yos. So, as you can see, these are just the various places we've been to. And I think uh, whilst we're very happy here at uh, Yos, I think it's we looked at it, it's about time that we are looking on to, to get a, a building, and also because the cost of renting has gone up. I think we have mentioned that at the last AGM, that one of the, the drivers also, we have to consider that. And, and knowing the, the situation, it will continue to go up. And of course, the idea of the cost of uh, renting is that the rental cannot be used to build up an asset. Whereas uh, for if you have our own place, uh, the amount that we save in rental can go towards paying our expenses. But at the same time, you then end up with an asset at the end of the day. And that is actually a very important consideration for us to think about for the future of, uh, of BF in terms of continuing with our activities as I described earlier. And these are just some quick pictures of um, what we had. As you can see, we were, you know, we were very active, a lot of, uh, lot of involvement uh, through by members uh, and the families uh, and friends through the years. Of course, you all recognize <laughs> Jan Brahm is here. And that was when we have our Buddha Rupa that you, that you see behind me. And of course, we move all the way to yours. And this was the first Sunday, as you can see, full house, right? Uh, and we were sitting a lot closer together back then, okay? <laughs> so we have to have that at some stage, right? So, but you know, within reason, of course. So now what I'd like to do is play a very short video, uh, a couple of minutes, but the idea is to give you a, a broad picture of what it is. So hopefully that gives you a bit more figure. So let me do that now.
The Building Fund is now open for donations. Please donate generously to our Building Fund. We aim to provide Dhamma activities for you for the betterment of future generations and the continuity of the Buddha Sasana so that more minds can find bliss, joy and happiness. Hope you enjoyed that video that we had. We actually showed that at the AGM as well, but we thought this is something that we wanted to highlight and just give a bit of a figure. And now we'll go down to give a bit of an update on what has happened since the AGM approval that was given in uh, May this year. So much progress uh, was made since that time. And I think it's uh, important to note that we found out about the building that the potential building that we were interested in. Uh, only a, a month or so before the AGM. So we were really getting things in place to, to start looking at it. Um, of course, you know, you can't time this type of things. If the opportunity comes, then, you know, we have to take it. So, so that's why we have to move very fast. And, uh, but we're also starting from uh, almost a zero pace in terms of uh, the processes and uh, steps we need to take. So almost immediately, the building fund donation started from coming from members. Uh, thank you for all that. Uh, and salutes to all of you for your uh, efforts to, to, to help to move things along. Um, so we also made that RBF made an offer to buy at the AGM approved bid of 11 million. Uh, but of course, the seller was asking for a higher amount. The original uh, price they were looking for was 12.5 million. And so it was like trying to make, they came a bit down, but they were not prepared to move much further beyond that. Um, but they wanted to have, they did ask us to say, uh, if you can offer a price to them, they will consider it. So this was something that we kept there. Uh, they knew of our interest. And so that was what the purpose was. We then organized within EXCO to do a set of building committee and the infrastructure committee, because we needed to get the processes in place to move this along. We recognize this is a multi-year effort. It's going to be at least three, three year plus easily, right? So the idea was to set in place the infrastructure to help us along that way. Guarantors were also formalized. We are very, very uh, grateful that the existing guarantors for our BFE's building were willing to uh, continue on to the new uh, mortgage loan that we will have to take, plus adding on an extra uh, guarantor. So this actually uh, helped us in our process. Uh, of course, the mortgage application, this was the first thing we needed to get. And we wanted to get the mortgage to be approved uh, with the company, the finance company, which has to offer the highest valuation. Uh, an interesting point to note here is that uh, there are not many organizations, uh, financial institutions out there that are willing to lend to associations. Uh, banks were not interested uh, because it was uh, a lot more complicated for them. And so therefore, uh, we, uh, the only offers we could deal with was to true finance companies. And that, that actually is a very common one. So it's nothing to do with uh, BF or the name. It's just that's the nature of the market. Uh, the reason being, a very short uh, description is that the reason being that uh, when, they, when an institution lends to an association, they have to essentially go through EOGMs and get members approval. So it's much more difficult for them to get certainty. So that's the reason why they are, they are a bit more uh, reluctant to do that. We qualified the process to buy. There were a lot of them, uh, taxes to pay, uh, the rules by URA, IRS, uh, IRAS, and uh, the legal areas. Then project management, again, we are very grateful that a long-time BF member involved in building development uh, in, his, uh, in his own uh, capacity uh, has agreed to be the project manager uh, to help BF along the way. So this certainly uh, helped, I think, the EXCO uh, a great deal to understand that someone with a deep experience in that area is able to help guide us along. So that was a very, very uh, important uh, consideration for us. Then, of course, we, we set up a dedicated website, uh, which you will see later on today. So the purpose of today is to essentially roll out this website. Uh, it's a dedicated website and payment infrastructure because uh, that is important to support uh, this long-term uh, donation drive that we're looking at. Now, so we managed to get all this done. But I am afraid I have a bit of a uh, bad news for to share with members. The property that we were initially looking at, the Sims Avenue property, was recently sold, uh, literally about uh, maybe a couple of weeks back, and it was sold for eleven point eight million. Now, BF, as you know, our AGM approved a bid of eleven million, so we could not raise the bid, uh, partly because we were still waiting for the mortgage approval due to the delay in terms of uh, and a, a lot more processes we have to go through 
as a society and association, right? At the same time, uh, we also require EOG approval, but that is actually uh, not an issue because from the uh, very beginning, we had informed the seller that we would require a EOGM approval. So anything we offer would have to be conditional upon the EOGM approval. So hence that was less of an issue, but the main problem was the mortgage because we doubt that we don't have enough uh, funds in the bank. And at the same time, our official, um, our uh, fundraising activities, uh, whilst it was, uh, it actually garnered uh, quite a, fair, a bit of uh, our funds. Uh, at the same time, we have received pledges to date of about a million. So therefore, um, it's still not enough because we are talking about having to meet the payment uh, in within three months. So it's actually quite a, a big step. And so because of that, we have started to look for alternative sites already. And if you recall, for those who attended AGM, this was the option two that was uh, put up and, and members had approved. So we were looking for alternative sites. So therefore the next step is, it's a bit of a, as they say, a chicken or an egg situation. Um, we, we are thinking that uh, the Exco decided that we will need to raise the funds to enable the Exco to move faster on alternative locations. So with this plus the, um, because the mortgage itself will again have to be renegotiated with any new property we have because the institution, financial institution, will only lend based on the uh, property at hand, okay? And so therefore, uh, it is good that if we are able to have a little bit of a funds in place under our building fund, to then be able to move a bit faster. So continue with the launch today of the donation drive for our new BF Dama home. So fundraising efforts will continue is our uh, announcement to the BF community here. So I think at this stage, we will also, the EXCO, uh, on behalf of the EXCO, I think we, we would really like to ask members to say that, you know, we are really doing this for members and for community as well. And at the same time, uh, that's the next generation to think about because the ex additional space that we hope to have will be very helpful to broaden our uh, efforts. Our current, uh, for example, our current junior and junior youth group is essentially bursting at the seams. Uh, the teachers uh, have mentioned that, you know, we have more, uh, we, we really can't, uh, you know, uh, cope with the type of space that we're having here. So certainly that is a very good problem to have in the sense of we have a high demand. <laughs> so now we have to think of how to supply that. And ultimately, we are doing this for the Buddha, Dhamma, Sasana, Sangha. So essentially, the, the, the point of going through this is really to help build the, the stage for the, uh, for the next generation as well. So moving on, uh, I will quickly run through the next few slides to identify things that we have uh, put in place. So this actually is a very broad process that we're going through. So we have to do fundraising, we have to look at the website, payment platform, and finally, the effort put in by all our volunteers and donors. So the fundraising types varies. We have our donors and sponsorships. We have the channels that we reach out to. Peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, we hope that you will uh, talk to your friends, talk to your relatives, and uh, explain the, the importance of this to them uh, and for the Buddhist community, as well as for uh, you know, yourselves or for fellowship, uh, organizing retreats and uh, activities, uh, interactive fundraising. So uh, that we have many ideas that come in from members to say, may I do this to raise funds for, the, for BF? Um, so we, our, our answer to them is, could you please uh, you know, come and, uh, and uh, you know, if you like, arrange with uh, the office and uh, Exco and we will, so that we can coordinate. Um, but we would also appreciate if you have, um, go ahead and do the activity. And then with the funds collected, you can make that uh, collection to BF uh, in terms of the, um, the activity that was raised. But that will make it a lot easier for, for uh, the volunteers as well, for other volunteers. So thank you very much for your efforts on that. But, uh, you know, if you could arrange for your own activities, feel free to do that. And then uh, and you can donate to BF. I think that would be very, very helpful. Thank you. Um, then, of course, we want to do the seller break fundraising, which I will go through a little bit after this, and which is what the website is supporting, which by the time we will go through in more detail later on. So this dedicated website launch is today. So that's the key thing we're trying to uh, showcase today. And of course, we partner with organizations. Uh, BF, we also uh, support other organizations, as you will see later. And uh, at the same time, we also look at foundations to see whether they can help us. So this is the uh, very quick snapshot of the seller break options. So this would be what was put into the website. 
So the, essentially, we have many opportunities. Uh, we start from the big, uh, which we just put as a notional price of $100. But as uh, Brett, I will explain later, we even have an option where it is no, uh, there's no minimum sum. You can donate anything you like as a normal cash donation. So this is just an op an, another way of uh, changing that. And of course, uh, we look at the website donation platform. We hope that we hope the website will be, will be inspiring to yourselves and your uh, friends when you uh, when you ask them to go there. Easy to use. Uh, we hope that uh, this will actually help you to see the navigation is quite easy. Uh, it serves uh, overseas uh, donors as well. If they are for our supporters overseas, uh, they can actually go through credit card and things like that. Many payment options there. Uh, VF Office is a central point of contact, and we try to make it as an automated receipt acknowledgement so that um, you know it makes it easier all around. So uh, the more important part I think I want to highlight here is the teamwork. Yes, ultimately, it's our volunteers and donors. Uh, as the saying goes, many hands make light work. So who are our volunteers and donors? We have the BFX crew itself who volunteers, the PRO team who volunteers, uh, then of course the building committees, the website team, the infrastructure team, and more important, and finally, but also very importantly, the BF members and friends, because you are the supporters of BF. I think without your help, uh, this effort will not be able to succeed. So I think that is a very important point we have to stress here. But I'm also very, very uh, you know, uh, conscious that we have to stress this is where we work together. So we can make this work. And this is the, the we is a very important part. So the expo will try to move things along and, and uh, get the, the property and uh, assess it and propose it to the membership to, to make a decision. But at the same time, we also, as you all know, uh, you know things are not exactly uh, cheap to buy a property in Singapore. So we have to uh, you know, uh, ask the members to have a look at it and see if this is an effort that they are able to support. Please come forward and you will have many opportunities through the website later. So finally, uh, we continue to look for a suitable place to call our own, our own Dhamma home. So I think this is very uh, important point we still want to go ahead. Uh, and we hope that we all look forward to go together into this new future. And finally, thank you to everyone uh, who are calling in. And if you can help spread the news around, we will put this, uh, this, uh, the information out on the website later on as eblast. So information is available. Uh, if for some reason you need some more info, do contact us. We're very happy to see what we can do. So thank you very much. I will now pass on to Brad Taiwi to lead us to the website presentation. Hi, good afternoon, Brian and sister. My name is uh, Kai Wee. So uh, thank you for actually joining us for these afternoon sessions to launch our BF fundraising website for our new BF Dharma Home. So what you see here uh, in front of you, the screen, is actually it's a new website that we have developed. And this will be the main platform that we'll be using to actually do fundraising for this uh, very noble Dharma project uh, to build a new Dharma Home for Buddhist Fellowship. Uh, before I actually uh, go into the details of this website, I would like to actually say thank you to the volunteers who actually spent nights just to, actually, to build this website. So uh, these volunteers are Sister Jie Su, Brother Rong Han, Brother Kenry, uh, Brother Chi Hao, and also we have a sister who is helping us to put out the video later on, uh, Sister Kai Sing. So later you actually can see the launch of the website. I would like to say thank you to all of them. Let's give them three sadhu, 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 sadhu. So now I should go into the website uh, to actually do, do a quick introduction. Then later I'll go through the step-by-steps -step on how to use the website and how to navigate. Uh, the whole idea for doing this website is actually to engage. We, we would like to actually engage the member, engage a potential donor about our projects to share information through website. So you actually can get all information relating to these projects uh, from here. And also we provide mean. Uh, a very simple mean for you to do donation. You don't have to come down to BF, right? Especially now so that uh, we're in a COVID situation. Coming down can be quite troublesome. So using a website, uh, be it from your mobile phone or at your desk in front of you, uh, using a laptop, you can actually can make a donation to us, right? So later you can actually can see how simple is it to do that. Now, second thing actually that we want to do, uh, use a website, is also to help the BF uh, office uh, at the back end as well. So as you know, this is not going to be a one-time, uh, one short-term project. It's going to be quite long-term, right? We are looking at probably two to three years actually for this thing to happen. And fundraising probably will continue for quite some time. So that's why we dedicate this website 
with the backend engine, uh, some technology implement behind to help the office staff uh, to actually to process the donation so that they actually can, actually can uh, take out some of the current work that they're doing in the office actually to manage the donation, right? That is actually to help them to improve the productivity as well. So to actually align with the government uh, driving the drive of uh, digitalization. So BF, we are doing that as well. We are trying to make use of technology to do things easier and faster. Okay, so enough setting about the website. I go straight into the website, uh, how to navigate around. So when you launch the website, uh, the, our domain name for the website is called bfdamahome.org, right? Later we'll see the domain name. So once you actually key in this uh, domain name, you can actually can come to this page, the landing page. Uh, the website basically are organized into three simple sections. Uh, one is actually to introduce about BF, which Brother Pang Hong has actually done it very well uh, earlier. Uh, but in this website, we actually provide more information as well so that you actually can find out more in case you want to know more about, for those who are not familiar with BF, you want to know more about BF, you can actually come to this website to look at it. Uh, the second segment of it actually is the supporter messages. Uh, BF, we have a lot of friends, a lot of good supporter. A supporter not only uh, through donation, but supporter through by giving Dharma, right? our Dharma, Dharma speakers, uh, our partners that we work with very closely, and also not forgetting the members and friends in the Buddhist community. So all these are actually our supporters. And we also have a segment there for all our friends, Dharma friends and brothers and sisters to actually to give uh, some encouragement to the whole project. Uh, like I say, this is not something that uh, we'll finish within six months or so, right? It's going to be a long drawn uh, process for us. So along the way, we may hit some hiccups or may hit some hurdles, but the supporters' messages will be very encouraging for all of us. So that's why uh, this supporter message is very important. Uh, later, I'll go through the details on that. And of course, most importantly, but uh, not the least, is actually the don donation segment. That's where you actually can donate, uh, make a donation to our BF uh, building for projects, right? So that is actually a quick intro on the three segments. So in the main page, you can actually can see these three page, uh, three segments all put in together in a very summarized and concise form, right? So moving down the net website, you can actually can see the progress of the web, uh, our BF Dharma home uh, projects, where we are in terms of the latest. Uh, so today is a launch of the website. So that's why today on the 29th of August, we are doing the launch. Uh, later, we update the status where Brother Bang Hong has provided in terms of the, the potential site that we want to actually uh, purchase. Right? So that, that will be updated after today's uh, presentation. We will show a quick intro about the BF. Uh, later, I'll click more that you show you that over here, these are some history on BF, which you, you can actually uh, find out more. And also some of the organization that we have been uh, working together to help the propagation of the Dharma. So Brother Pang Ho also mentioned earlier that for BF, one of the things that we do, uh, is not just actually to take care of the members uh, propagation of the Dharma through the, uh, BF, but we also help other organization as well especially so the art organization that they don't have enough uh, space to conduct that event, like holding a retreat, holding a talk, uh, we do actually do contribute in that sense, right? So these are some of the organization that we have been uh, working uh, with them to actually to help in the propagation of Dharma. Uh, not all, there are, there are some more that we did not show here. Uh, once we actually have the confirm uh, approval uh, from the art organization to put their logos in here, we actually will update accordingly, right? So, so that's the reason why you only see four. Uh, items here. Then you can also see uh, all the ESCO's member. In case you don't know who are the ESCO members, you can, you can see from here, right? So all their nice pictures are actually pre being presented here. And most importantly, our patron and advisor, right? So we do have Ajahn Brahm and uh, Venerable Vatasana. Actually, they are our spiritual patron. And we also have Sister Silver Bay as a Dharma advisor as well, right? So that is actually very much about Buddhist fellowship. So coming back to the next segment, which is the messages, the supporter uh, messages, which is very encouraging. So we are very fortunate that we do have uh, very strong support from our spiritual patron, our long-term Dharma speaker, uh, Bhante uh, Buddha Vatika, and our spiritual patron, uh, advisor as well, Sister Silverby. So they have given us very strong support and you can, she can read their messages over here. Uh, now I take this opportunity to move into the supporter message. The supporter message are all found here. Uh, you can also realize that 
there is a segment for you as a member or a friend of BF to give us encouragement, right? be it uh, individual or from organization. So do you feel free to make sort of this function where you actually can key in uh, the names, organization names, the contact info, and the encouraging messages that we like to give to BF for this uh, long-term project that we're embarking on, uh, BF Dharma Home. So once you actually receive this message, we actually will process internally and uh, we'll post it after we have processed. So uh, do give us some time because this is actually a public website. So we need to have a time that you to review all the comments before we can post it. So it will not be real time, right? Just to make sure that there's no offensive word or some uh, mischievous uh, behavior that the people actually will try to. So actually more to protect the BF and members in this case, right? So that is actually how we actually can uh, do the supporting message. Now, I'll move on to actually the most important part, which is the whole, uh, one of the key purpose, right? For this BF website. Uh, this is actually how to contribute your donation, right? Uh, over here, as Brother Hapraho mentioned, there are many ways you can contribute, donates to BF, right? Not just uh, in terms of uh, money, but also in terms of a suggestion as well, right? So here, this segment is focused on how you can contribute using monetary money, right? So we, we make a website uh, simple for you to actually to contribute. Now, uh, earlier, Brother Pang Hong mentioned that there are few uh, uh, items that you can actually can donate to, right? These are all symbolic items. Uh, for example, the bricks, right? So uh, we do have uh, uh, items that bricks you can donate to, but uh, but actually it's just symbolic, right? It's not physically you're donating a brick. Huh? So we also don't know how many bricks we will need to actually to build the building. Right? So it's a symbolic, symbolic uh, uh, way of donating. And every, every brick actually comes with a notion of price of uh, $100, right? You can donate as many bricks, as many bricks as you want, right? You can donate 1,000, one, or even 500, right? It depends on what you want. Uh, the other items you can donate is actually a column. Every building needs to have a column as a, as a very as a structure that support the building, right? You can actually think of it as actually dharma. Right? Dharma is from a very strong pillar to support our practice, right? And every one of us, uh, spiritual journey. So that is actually from a very strong symbolic uh, donation item as well. And each column uh, is about hundred. Uh, it's one thousand dollars. Now that is actually an introduction. Uh, briefly to uh, describe to you what you can donate. So I will now take the opportunity to go into the detail. Uh, show you everything, right? I show hand, don't have to go through one by one. So basically to donate, you can donate a brick, you can donate to a column, you can donate to a Buddha, uh, small Buddha niche, which is cost at uh, $10,000. Uh, just take note that for Buddha niche, uh, there is a limited numbers that we can take because what we intend to do is that uh, for the donated amount to the niche, we actually will place the Buddha statues in a small room, in the room. Right? And there is a limited space for us. So for now, we actually we plan for 100. You'll see how it goes, right? So, so that's why uh, the, the, there is a quantity that we could actually put into the, the limitation for that. Uh, in terms of rooms, you also need a donation as well. So uh, you'll know that uh, in current BF premise, we only have uh, three rooms for us, or four rooms, right? For us actually to conduct our activities. So these four rooms is not enough, especially so when we do have a lot of kids coming back after the COVID. Right, so that's why we need to have more rooms. And over here, we actually plan to have ten rooms, right, uh, for the new buildings. Uh, of course, uh, we also have a library that we'll continue to have. Uh, so that is also an item you can donate to. And lastly, the most important one actually is the uh, a place for the sangha members to stay when they come and visit us or conduct a retreat or give us talk. So there will be a sangha room and, and suite that actually we actually have planned for as well. So please uh, feel free to actually take, take a look at all these items. Uh, uh, let us know which, are, which items you actually prefer to donate. And you know, in case you are interested to donate, say for example, to a library, just click on the button on donate library and fill in the details, right? So this is the details you can fill in and the payment as uh, we mentioned earlier is going to be seamless. So there are actually a few ways that you can donate uh, payment. One is actually through credit card, uh, QR code, which is very common in Singapore now. So uh, if you have a QR code registered with your mobile phone, use that means that you do, uh, to do your payment for the donation, that would be the most convenient way. And of course, you also have set bank transfer and check as well. Right? So uh, pay now, which is your QR code, right? Yeah. So 
that, that is actually how we will accept. Uh, maybe if I could just take one quick uh, minute to actually to show you how it looks like. So, so basically, information actually is uh, the information is important because we would like to actually to get in contact with you in case there's any issues. So always remember that uh, your contact information like your emails and uh, mobile phone number is actually is important. And in the event that you want to donate, make a donation in the name of someone else, uh, you can actually can indicate to us as well. So we can actually can record it. So in this case, it's made on behalf of BF. Right. Okay, just a quick. All right. So this is the payment screen. The details is actually same as what you had uh, key in just now. So the in terms of payment method. You can either choose a credit card if you prefer to do so, or the manual payment, right? Manual payment is a, is a place where you actually can use pay now, bank transfer, and uh, check payment, right? So over here, uh, do take note that because if you're using a manual payment, uh, the next screen that you, 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 will come, you will see after you click on pay now, uh, the messages actually is really meant for credit card payment. So you can just ignore the messages for the uh, next message, for example, the payment is being processed, right? So if you have not paid, make payment through pay now, when you come to this page, uh, doesn't mean that you don't have to pay, right? Uh, you still have to continue to do, make, make the actual payment uh, after this page. That's where uh, you'll see the QR code for your pay now uh, and use that QR code that you to scan and pay, make the payment, right? So that, that is actually one thing that you need to take note when you make a payment through uh, QR code. Now, that, that is actually a simple introduction how you actually can make donation. Uh, of course, we also mentioned that uh, any amount is actually uh, is welcome for this donation. You don't have to fix to a donating an items. Uh, there are people who, actually who just want to donate money. So if you want just to donate money, uh, feel free to make use of this function, donate cash. Uh, any amount is welcome, right? So don't worry about uh, the amount here. If you find that you want to donate Amount that is actually not listed here, $50 or even $1,000, that you want to donate 888, you can do so as well. Just key in 888 and submit the payment through there. Right. Now, the last part, uh, which is a bit uh, special, because this is the area that you can donate to uh, a more, uh, what you call a bigger ticket item, right? especially for Dharma Hall. Because Dharma Hall, usually the space is big and it's a bit more complicated, which we need a lot of money to actually to build. So that is the part that we did not put in the price uh, because we also uh, don't want to put a price at this moment. Yeah, because the assessment has not been done, but it's not going to be cheap to what we think. So that's why if you are interested to donate to this area, the Dharma Halls or even the Buddha Relics Chamber, uh, do leave us a contact and you, by using uh, the contact us form for this special item. For example, you want to uh, donate a Dharma hall to, uh, and you want to find out more on how to go about doing that, uh, give us your contact by submitting this form to us. We will get in contact with you uh, at, a, at a time that you specify uh, at your convenience. And from there, we can discuss further on how to proceed from there. Right. So that is actually how you, we make use of the donation functions in the website. So I, I hope uh, this actually will give you a very good uh, understanding on the process of making donations through the website. And we really hope that uh, moving forward, after we launch this website, uh, all donations to our BF Dharma Home projects will be able to come through this format so that it will be easier for everyone, right? Uh, both uh, the donors itself and as well as the BF uh, staff at the back end office, right? So, with that, I think I'll probably will end my uh, sharing in the BF website. So, if there's any questions, feel free to raise it to us, write, down, write an email to us or call us. We are more than happy to answer. Thank you, Brother Tavi. And as uh, Brother Tavi mentioned, we are very appreciative to all the team that actually worked together to get this website up uh, in a very short period of time. I might add, it is actually a very uh, lot of work there. So thank you very much uh, to Brother Tavi too, uh, as well as the rest of the team.
So uh, one thing to add is also if you, for some reason, I know some uh, members may not be familiar with the computer systems and all the rest, uh, do feel free, you can call us directly at the office as well. And we are also uh, able to help you uh, to, to navigate if anything, all right? So with that option is always there. That's why we, we don't mention it, uh, but it's always there. Do just call, reach out to us and we're very uh, uh, happy to have a talk to you separately. So just to just to add to that. Uh, so I will now pass on to Sis Eiling to bring us to the next one. Uh, meantime, let me thank uh, Brother Taiwi for leading the web, uh, web team, as well as uh, all those who are involved in the team, uh, but um, including uh, Sister Hui Kim, who wrote a lot of those uh, uh, descriptions, mm -hmm. and the office team for checking, as well as... Uh, uh, Brother Pang Hong for leading the EXCO team. Okay, now let us welcome Ajahn. Yay! Oh, Ajahn, how are you? Hi! Hi, Hi Ajahn, <laughs> good to see you. Yeah, good to see you. I'm wearing my beanie because it's cold in Australia. <laughs> cold in Perth. Okay, yeah. let's say uh, three, uh, our respects by giving Ajahn three bars. Mm. <laughs> Very good. Thank you, Ajahn, for Thank coming you, in early to help us launch our site. Uh, I'll hand over to Brother Pang Hong to give you an update of uh, a summary of yeah. what has been happening. Yes. Thank you, uh, Sis Aling. Uh, so welcome, Ajahn. Uh, it's actually very good to see you again. Um, and. Um, Happy birthday as well for our wishes way earlier, but uh, we still have to all that in mind. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting old now. <laughs> so anyway, even though I'm supposed to be 70, I got this lovely card from somebody and uh, had a big picture of Donald Trump on the front. Oh. And the, the caption was, I demand a recount. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really 70. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, but it's very, very good to hear. Uh, you know, our general, you know, is uh, had a had a good celebration there. I think we we are the one that wanted to celebrate it. I think, uh, and this is something that uh, is is uh, very helpful that we're able to share in the global uh, celebration. So. Yeah. Um, so Ajahn, uh, thank you for joining us early today uh, because we have a we have a talk after this. Uh, but we also did our launch, uh, as you know, in the, of the, our official launch of our fundraising effort for our building. We had actually uh, received AGM approval earlier um, and actually did a soft launch. Uh, so we had members who are already coming in through word of mouth, uh, but we haven't really uh, launched it officially yet because of uh, we didn't have the infrastructure, the website and, and things like that ready. And so this is why we spent the time in between to get it in place. Uh, and uh, this was what we were explaining to members before uh, you, you came online, Ajahn. Uh, I think that the main thing is we mentioned that um, uh, this is a long effort, long-term effort, maybe a two to three year type effort. Um, and we, but uh, we are very, very grateful, Ajahn, for your words of support. Uh, which we have prominently displayed on our website, right? uh, together with all the words of support from our uh, Bhante Ratanasara, as you know, and then uh, Bhante Buddha Rakita, as well as uh, Sister Sylvia Bay. So I think these are very, very helpful to, to members that uh, I think for that this is something that is worth um, done to. And I think this is where I think all our brothers and sisters out there uh, will be hopefully looking forward to do this. Um, so what, what, what happened just now earlier on, uh, Ajahn, before you came in, was that I just gave them an update on uh, what our processes were in terms of uh, after the AGM, uh, what, what we went through on the logistics. As Ajahn knows, you know, uh, it's a lot of uh, logistics in getting, <laughs> I think, um, the, the fundraising effort that Ajahn uh, initiated for investment <laughs> was very helpful and I think uh, we take the lead from there as well and uh, so these are things that um, over the next uh, two three years we will be doing an ongoing uh, effort uh, ultimately uh, 
So this is uh, where we are today. Uh, we don't have a, a building in uh, in uh, purchase at the moment. We actually have to do that uh, pre-building uh, until uh, we identify uh, an alternative building. Uh, we had initially identified one, but uh, unfortunately that was uh, sold at a higher price than what we were prepared to pay. Uh, it's, it's the nature of, of life. And so I think uh, in that sense, we are now going forward to uh, look for alternatives as well. Uh, so that's just a very short uh, update uh, to Ajahn on what, what we're looking at as well. So maybe Ajahn, may I invite you to say a, a few words uh, before the uh, we do the official launch uh, of this website, uh, which Ajahn will, will start the, 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 if you like, press the button. <laughs> <laughs> very good. I'm very glad you don't get me to have a bottle of champagne to actually to launch the website by crashing it against the new building. No, we don't do it that way. We're much more refined the way that we encourage everybody to realize this is a very, very, very worthwhile project to have, you know, a place which the Buddhist fellowship is, can call you know, their own. And when people say, well, we're not supposed to own anything. But of course, the Buddhist fellowship is not one person, not the committee, it's everybody who goes to uh, meditate there, listen to Dhamma there, even people who join the website to listen to a, a talk which is streamed there. They can all make use of it. And I know to know from my own experience that I don't own Bodhinyana Monastery, where I'm talking from right now. It's owned by all of us, in the sense that every one of you, many of you have done that, have come here and made use of the place, shared the place. So it's... Uh, Whenever we have even a monastery, it's always for the Sangha of the four quarters present and yet to come, for everybody. And that's the same with a, a place for the Buddhist fellowship. For so many years, you know, we've been talking about this, even when I first came to the Buddhist fellowship, they talked about it, but it was a dream. It was something which was more well, maybe in the future sometimes. The wonderful thing is about dreams is making them real and seeing that they are possible. And even though things are very expensive in Singapore, they're very expensive, but nevertheless, they're very valuable. Things which have a high price have a high value. And having a place for yourselves, a place where I can come and visit as well, and see that's our place. And I remember I look upon the Buddhist fellowship with a sense of pride in myself, seeing it from its very earliest years, not the earliest years, but in some of the very early years, and seeing it grow so well into a beautiful center, which is not just for, for Theravada monks and nuns, but for everybody, everybody to come to, but in a way which is um, free from some of the burdens of the past, which uh, can sometimes drag Buddhism into a sense of like lethargy, a sense of, no, you can't do this, this is the way it's always been done, to make sure it's done even better than the times of the past, more meaningful, more appropriate, so people can go there and they feel that, yeah, this is the sort of place where I want to go and where people can get so much benefit from it. And there are huge amounts of benefits from having your own place. And I know that because as a Buddhist monk, <laughs> I've got my own place in the sense of this monastery. And they've got your own know, centers and they're always growing, getting more centers as we as we uh, expand, we don't expand because we want to be big or great or anything. We expand because there's a need there. There's a need for p places where people can go to. And even though you think, well, you know, we can put all these things online, we can, we can hire this place or hire that place. There's something which happens to a center when people go there regularly. And I've seen that in places like, you know, over here in Australia. Even the old story, there was somebody who came to see me after lunch and the gentleman told me that he was uh, working in our local council, giving building approvals for all our projects, which we did. I'd never seen him before. I've seen his signature many times, but he said he came here to, to say thank you for our properties, our monasteries, car park, and that was really weird. He said he was resigning. He was not resigning. He's retiring that day. That, was, that day was his last day at work. And every time he got stressed out at work, he would drive to our car park in Bodhinyana Monastery 
would sit in his car and just see the peace, the comfort, the softness of the monastery grounds was enough for him to get rid of his stress and after 15 or 20 minutes to drive back to work feeling like refreshed. And he wasn't a Buddhist. He was just an ordinary Aussie worker, Australian worker. But he found just having a place where people come to, their place, where, you know, it's going to be there for years, decades, a long time. It builds up the energy of peace, the energy of acceptance, safety, kindness. And when you go to places like that, you can feel that energy. It's something real. And other people feel it. And that's because it's yours. You build it that way. You construct it. And you reinforce it. And after the while, it becomes such an easy place to meditate. An easy place to find peace. An easy place to find meaning. Even though the words aren't there, it's a quiet place. Still the feeling, what the words are pointing to, is what grows in your own place. And so after a while... The Buddhist Fellowship's center over the years will become an amazing place, a place where many people can find peace, can find answers to the problems of their life, and find safety and comfort. And that's a huge thing to offer to people in Singapore. It's nice to be able to come to Perth or go over to other countries, but we can't sometimes, whether it's because of COVID or because of finances. Having your own place is a wonderful dream. And the point is to dream good dreams, high dreams, and make those dreams a reality. And then you become part of it. And sometimes, <laughs> I'm 70, I'm getting old. But, no, sorry, that's wrong. I'm not getting old. I'm already old. <laughs> but then you look at all the things which, you know, you have been a part of over all these years, and that gives you so much joy. It's a life which is already you know, pretty well lived. I haven't got any plans to go anywhere yet. But 70 is still reasonably young in Buddhism, as monasticism. But nevertheless, uh, I want to see a beautiful place in Singapore for the Buddhist fellowship. Their place, not rented, not shared. You deserve your own place. And to build up just the energies, the legacies, the dreams and the hopes and the histories of peace, wisdom and kindness for all beings in Singapore or who visit. It's a dream whose time has come to start. And I say two years, well, that's very fast, two years, but even three or four years, it'd be wonderful to be able to come uh, on the aircraft and see that place maybe from the sky and then see it real on the ground. And each one of you are part of that. I can do my bit, but each one of you have to do your bit. It's something you're proud of. You know, when you eventually you pass away or when your your children reflect on what you've done for other beings, you built a Buddhist center, not an ordinary center. Buddhist fellowship is unique. It's not run by monks or by nuns. It's run by you, people, community. And it's a wonderful thing to have. I don't know how many centers there are like this in Singapore, but I don't think there are any. I'm not sure, I may be wrong. But certainly not a one which is so outgoing, so progressive, and so meaningful as a Buddhist fellowship in Singapore. It's a project whose time has come. And I encourage each one of you to really help out as much as you can. Small donations, big donations, whatever donations to see how we can make this work. It costs a lot of money, but remember, the harder it is, the more meritorious it is. <laughs> so it's wonderful you're actually doing this. So you don't go around thinking about, oh, it's too hard, it's too much, oh, we don't need to do this. No, don't just think about it, just do it. There's something which is powerful in the spiritual path of letting go, of doing something wonderful for others and for yourself as well, for your family for the people of Singapore. You deserve it. So please, make it happen. And I'm looking forward to seeing it in a few years' time. Wow. <laughs>
Thank you, John. May we request a blessing for our success. Certainly. Giant body amule Sakaya nang nandi wadano E wang to wang vijayo ho hijaya sujaya mangale Aparajita palanke si se pata vi pokare Abhi se ke sapa buddhana aga pato pamoda tisunakatang sumangalang supabatang suhutitang sukano sumuhutu chasuyitang brahmacharizu Patakinang kaya kamang, wacha kamang, patakinang, patakinang mano kamang, panidite patakina, patakina nikatwana, labantate padakine. Sadu, sadu, sadu. Ooh, yeah. Very good. Wow, you can't fail after that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ajahn. And Brother Pang Ho, uh, can you help us count down? Yes. Yes, okay, I'll just get some water in my cup. Uh, Ajahn? Yes. Yeah. Okay, here we go. Are you ready? No, not ready yet. <laughs> okay. When you're ready, let me know. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, five four, four, three, two, one. It is launched. Woohoo! <laughs> so the Buddhist Fellowship Dharma Home is now launched the idea is now online <laughs> now we want to turn that online <laughs> so, in, in bank Ajahn's view is a bit delayed from our view <laughs> so, well done everybody well done Yay. very good thank you Ajahn. thank you Ajahn. i am very happy that's a picture of the old place. I remember that very, very well. <laughs> Excellent. Guided meditation. So, if you would, for 10 minutes, if you please just close your eyes. And with your eyes closed, you become more aware of my voice and your own body. And in particular, your own body, whether you're sitting on the floor, sitting on a seat, or even laying down in a bed if you're sick or ill. How does your body feel right now? You start to become aware of your body and relaxing it. How are your legs right now? Ask your legs as if they were different people from you. Legs, how do you feel? Do you want to be moved, adjusted? And if they do, mine did want to be moved, and I'm just putting my feet flat on the floor. Bottom, how are you? Do you want to be adjusted? When you ask your body with kindness, it's like you're establishing a mindful connection with that part of your body. When you ask the question, it gives you an answer. You can feel that your bottom may need a little bit of adjustment. You ask your back how it feels, whether it needs to be stretched, needs to be leaned back, or what it needs. 
you're developing the combination of mindfulness together with kindness, what I call kindfulness, to your back. And you find if you become aware of your back and adjust it appropriately with kindness, not with force, you find you're coming into the present moment, you're becoming aware, and you're also developing a healthy body. And I ask the organs, even in my torso, how are you? you know, from the digestive system to all the organs, like the, the stomach, the heart, the lungs, the kidneys and livers, and all the, the muscles and stuff in my torso, which is really important. How are you? And if ever I feel a sense of tension, tightness anywhere, or just a feeling which you know, is unusual, I just allow my attention to go right into it. Instead of trying to avoid it, I go towards it. When I go towards and into that sensation, I can give it kindness and it relaxes. Just in the same way, like an, an animal you pass on the street, whether it's like a cat or dog or even, like, even a snake. You give it kindness, I'm never going to harm or hurt you. And you find that animal understands somehow and doesn't harm you back. I give those feelings to my body. The parts of my body relax and their tightness gets less. They tend to allow healing to happen. So all parts of my body tend to relax to the max when I go towards them with mindfulness and with kindness. Then my body starts to relax so beautifully. It feels not just comfortable, but delightful. The delightful feeling of relaxation. I go to my arms, how are my arms now? Do you want to be moved, arms and hands? They say, no, we're comfortable. Head. How's your head now, especially in your brain with all those thoughts, all the work which the brain has to do. Brain, thank you for serving me so much. Now I wish you a few moments of peace. You don't have to solve any problems. You don't have to plan for the future or worry about anything. Brain, I'll give you some time off. Be peaceful. Relax. I feel my whole body relaxing. And it's wonderful. When the body is relaxed, you find there's nothing much you need to think about. You're peaceful. And that's when I start to access what I keep on calling the peaceometer. Something I just created. How peaceful are you? Give it a value from one till ten. Ten is very agitated, one is peaceful. Be honest. Once you know how peaceful you are, what makes that peace deeper? Go closer to one. What agitates you, disturbs that peace? Because you're watching part of the mind, an important part, peace, and giving it a sort of value and learning how to be more and more peaceful. At the same time, you start to feel the value of peace. How delightful it is just to be sitting here, not trying to watch the breath or you know, do anything. Just knowing peace and letting peace go deeper and deeper. Enjoying that peace. Know how delightful is the freedom the freedom from desire and craving. 
just being here, not measuring anything except just knowing peace. When this moment starts to become very delightful, very enjoyable, then things like the breath and other stuff, they come up by themselves. They come up inside the peace. You don't control them, otherwise you destroy that peace. You let them be. And if the meditation is working, it does have a sense of delight. This is so calming. Just like that story of that worker from our local council. He enjoyed the sitting in the car park of our monastery because he could feel the peace, enjoy it, and it healed him from his stress. You have nowhere to go, nothing to do. Sit down or lay down whatever you're doing. Enjoy this moment. Peace. Deep peace. Oh boy, <laughs> it's so easy to go over time when I do this. So now, how do you feel? If you don't want to come out, great. Unfortunately, you have to. So start feeling your body now. How are your legs and your bottom, your back and torso? arms and head, how do they feel now? Just now, eight or nine minutes of peace. It does make the body feel more healthy, more relaxed. It feels good, as it's supposed to. When you're ready, you can open your eyes. to end the meditation. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so for the talk. <laughs> you know, sometimes the meditation is just weird. Because this is our range retreat time now, and even though I'll do many things as well as uh, sit in my heart, you get extra energy of meditation at this time of the year. So you know, what happens, I'd, it's weird, but it's wonderful that when I sort of start getting some nice meditation coming up in my cave, which is just around the back of this building, which I'm sitting in now, when I get nice meditation, it just gets so much energy, and it's beautiful energy, and it makes me happy. And sometimes the happiness is a bit <laughs> over the top from other monks. And I said today to one of the junior monks, I said, no, I've got to, I've got to start meditating less because I'm getting too happy. <laughs> and it's weird, but it's so true. You get so much joy come up for your meditation. And you can share that joy with others. So I'm very happy to be able to share that with uh, the, the BF in Singapore. BF stands for the, the best fellowship in Singapore. B for best. But anyway... Just as talk is supposed to be on uh, apathy and equanimity. When I told some of the monks I'm going to talk about apathy this afternoon, I added, oh, I'm not sure whether I should talk about it or not. I'm pretty apathetic about apathy. <laughs> but he said it's a weird topic to talk about, but I think it's really important. And uh, to start off with, you know, in the style to which you've become accustomed, I do recall that. Uh, 
a little uh, article uh, written about uh, it's like sort of politics. I know Singapore, I love politics. <laughs> they usually come to Buddhist fellowship to get away from that. But anyway, there was a, the election for the Sydney University Student Union. So it's only a small thing, but one of the students there who was standing for election as president of the Sydney Students Union, of the university, Sydney University Students Union, he stood on the platform, he actually made his own party, the platform of the Apathy Party. He stood on a, on a, a political thing of apathy. And so he registered, and at the election, he only got about three votes. So, you know, that's never enough to win. But then he sort of made the claim that the majority of the university students who could vote didn't vote. There's only about 40% of people uh, put in a preference in the voting system. So he said 60% of people did not vote. 60% of people were apathetic. Therefore, I claim them as my, my followers. And with 60%, I guess, I guess I've won the election. So the apathy party <laughs> claimed victory <laughs> because most people in the universe didn't care about student union. And interesting way, he didn't actually manage to convince uh, the people who judge whether it's a fair election or not a fair election, but it's true that many people do become apathetic and they're feeling that that is important. That's what they should do to make a, make a claim. Apathy is sometimes a very strong statement which people make to say, I don't care because it's not so important to me. And this is some of the problems. Many people think that, okay, a religion or Buddhism or meditation, yeah, it might work for some or for monks or something, but not for everybody. I still remember when I was in Thailand, people said, look, many people, they don't go into the temple unless it's some sort of ceremony, because especially if you go there by yourself, say if a woman goes into the temple by herself to do some chanting or something, they say the only reason why people go into temples is because they're having some trouble at home. And they think that if a woman goes into a temple alone, it must be she's having trouble with her husband. And so they think, oh, I better not even go into the temple because that means that I get a bad reputation. And so you say, like, why do you go into a hospital? To see someone who's sick or because you're sick yourself? So because of that, sometimes people don't realise it's you know, the making peace, being kind, being gentle, it's not just just uh, something which is nice to do for your next life. It's even wonderful to do for this life as well. Making peace, being kind, being gentle, relaxing, learn to allow the body to be at peace is something which is powerful. What I'm saying here is that when we do nothing, we sit here and relax, you find that's not apathy. It's not apathy, it's like not caring. Not caring for your own body, for your health. Not caring for the people around you. Not caring for your community. Not caring for your country. Not caring for your world. You may call that apathy. But when we're peaceful and equanimous, that's something much more powerful. And that does work. Sometimes say, well, how can it work when you're doing nothing? And I know that some of you have seen this before, maybe all of you, but when I give a talk, I do notice that many times the people who listen to the talks, they're all they're getting older, elderly. And when you do get old and elderly, you tend to forget things. And I count on that with my talks because sometimes people have forgot. And I told this not so long ago. I got my visual aid, my cup, and I said this years and years ago, but it was very effective. And it was just how equanimity, contentment, rest, doing nothing, 
it's not apathy, but very powerful, of how to overcome stress. Because stress is such a common problem in our world, and you can go to see a psychologist, psychiatrist, or I don't know what, it costs a lot of money, or you can take some pills, which sometimes work, sometimes don't work. They have side effects. This therapy, there's no side effects, very cheap. It's amazing how well it works. When I first did it at a a computer conference, and I held up my cup. How heavy is my cup? Is there a cup here? How heavy is it? And the answer was, the longer you hold it, the heavier it feels. Obvious, isn't it? It's simple, but it's very profound. If I keep holding this cup for a few minutes, my arm starts to ache and gets into great pain. What should I do when it gets too heavy to hold comfortably? You just put it down, that's all. And rest. Do nothing. And after one, I was saying about 30 seconds, after 30 seconds, when I pick it up again, it actually feels much lighter. It's exactly the same weight because my arm holding the thing has rested. It feels lighter and it doesn't hurt when I hold it anymore. It's a simple teaching of that in our life, we do work very hard. We have many burdens we have to carry. But when those burdens get too heavy, we can't hold them comfortably. We just don't know how to put them down and relax and rest and leave them alone for five minutes. And if you can do that, if you do learn how to leave things alone and to relax and rest for a few minutes, the results are amazing. You feel more energy. You don't have to force yourself so much. When you pick up the cup again afterwards, it's light, easy to carry. Well, let's change it from holding a cup to actually to writing an article on your computer or just doing a report for your boss at work. And of course, you've all known, as I've known, that sometimes you're writing an email and just the words don't come out. You just you know the ideas are just not there. The reason is because your brain is tired. It needs a rest. And people, they're afraid to relax and rest, to find some equanimity, because they feel that equanimity is wasting time. Letting go, being at peace, relaxing. It's not wasting time, it's recharging, recharging your energies. And so when you go back to the computer, you go back to writing, you go back to whatever you're supposed to be doing in life, after you've stopped for a while, you find the energies are back there. You can write that article so quickly. Even just uh, yesterday, you know, I had my birthday and one of the things we do there to raise funds for birthdays, there's auction things. One of the things we auctioned was the original manuscript of my first book, Opening the Door of Your Heart. And please excuse me a moment because I've I've got the copy of the manuscript here. I'm just going to show it to you online. One moment. Now, this manuscript, written about 20 years ago by hand, hopefully you can see it okay. Just open up a page at random. Hope it's clear enough. That is all, sorry, make it. That is all handwritten, just not corrected just in a meditation retreat, which I was doing for myself, one hour every day for two weeks. And this beautiful handwriting came out. Can you see it okay? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so where is it? I'm trying to get it straight for you. I just want to go straight. Oh, here we go. That's better. There's a couple of hundred pages of this, all written, just getting the ballpoint pen, Ordinary paper, started writing, and no mistakes. 
And what I wrote down there is what appeared in the book. <laughs> no changes. It has come straight out. Simply because you're relaxed. You don't force it. And you've had a really good rest of your brain, not sleeping, but meditating. And that handwritten manuscript, well, some parts of it is in our local museum, believe it or not, University of West, and the West Australian Museum. And some parts of it get auctioned off. It's amazing, because even myself, I look at that, I'm inspired. Learning how to rest, relax, allowing equanimity to recharge you can just make your writing, your own handwriting. This is not sort of a script on, on a computer. This is actually just written with pen on paper. Perfect. And just no, no uh, errors. When I see stuff like that, I, I get inspired. It works. The trouble is, though, that we don't know how to relax. We don't know how to put the cup down. We misunderstand equanimity. We're afraid of it. We think it's apathy. We think it's wasting time. And of course, it's not at all. It's creating time. Which is why, you know, that simile of the cup, you know, I do it, I teach it so often, but it's apparently it's used in Harvard Business School. And there they call it an investment of time. In other words, one sits down there being equanimous, not reacting to the world, just letting it be. And you find that afterwards, the 10, 20, 30 minutes you spend in equanimity, you find you make up that time afterwards with profit, which means you get more work done after your time of being equanimous, resting. It means that the work you do is of higher quality. I just showed you, demonstrated the sort of quality which happens. We know how to relax the mind and how innovation happens. We live in a world where we have to innovate. We don't think that, oh, Ajahn Brahms and Mark, you just need to innovate. <laughs> I spent my whole life innovating, still keeping the tradition, being able to teach it in a way which makes it easier to understand, more penetrating, more powerful in a way which reaches more people. That's what I'm supposed to be doing. And of course, this is how it's done. Our problem is, of course, that we don't know how to be equanimous. Instead of saying equanimous, sometimes I call it contentment. That's my preferred translation now for upeka, just contentment. And how can you be content when you still need to raise funds for a beautiful center for the Buddhist fellowship? How can you be content when there's so much COVID in our world? How can you be content when there's just, there still always seems to be political violence in some countries? How can you have contentment at such times? You have contentment because it's absolutely necessary to find times when you can relax and rest and have a good sleep. Uh, because I was a mathematician before at Cambridge, before I became a monk, there was one a mathematician called Louis Pascal. And, and they, some of the things which some of these mathematicians say, you know, they're European, they're not Buddhist, but whew, this could have been said by a, a great teacher of meditation. And this was in the sometime in 1600 and something. So almost 400 years ago. And he said that all the problems of humankind, all the problems of humankind come from not knowing how to sit still. Not, not, not having to let go and have a rest, for goodness sake. And of course, you know, you know from your own personal experience what it's like. There's so many things to do, so many problems, the really big problems. How can I solve these problems? Sit down and do nothing. Be equanimous. It's not being apathetic because equan equanimity is dynamic. Things happen when you're equanimous. You recharge. 
you give your mind the opportunity to see different ways of doing things, to have great insights, see things differently. You get some of those things you see differently are great opportunities to actually to take you know, our culture further and deeper. And it works. You know, I can put my, you've all you know, come and see you know, the results of my sitting still and doing nothing. And you invite me to come <laughs> give talks all over the place. It's powerful. So much so that this is why you see that sitting down doing nothing actually is not apathy, it's not not caring. It's one of the kindest and most powerful things you can do for yourself and others. Just think about it, contemplate it. Just when you go home to, from work some days, you know, are, you, are you happy? How do you relate you know, to your, your family? your kids, your partner, your parents. Sometimes you're so tired, so stressed out. You don't sort of have, have time to actually just to care for people, it seems. I'll do that later. Oh, yeah, well, and one of the reasons is, is because you go home stressed. What would happen if when you felt the stress building up at work, you take five or 10 minutes out. And people say, well, you know, in some organizations, they do have meditation rooms. Actually, in all organizations, they have meditation rooms. And sometimes you just call them by different names. In most organizations, they call them rest rooms. <laughs> what does it mean, rest rooms? It means where you take a rest. That's what it's called. So you go there and sit down when you're constipated. <laughs> mentally <laughs> and you sit there and your boss says why are you in there for 15 minutes I was really constipated this time <laughs> all your boss is concerned with is your productivity you get the work done high quality and you're a nice person you know to actually to work with but you're productive as well and you find you're more productive are happier more joyful when you take that that break when you need it your brain can't work properly when it's really exhausted. And it, it, when it, you push it, you get upset and angry, irritated. A lot of unhappiness comes from not being able to rest. And you feel just nothing left. And you're almost like pushing the vehicle down the road because there's no gas or electricity or petrol or whatever you use left in your car. When you're energized, wow. This life is so easy. When you go back home and see your family and friends, you're happy, enjoying yourself. Wouldn't that be a nicer family life after going to work? So these things are actually powerful. But in order to have that equanimity, that contentment, you don't need things to be perfect to have contentment. <laughs> so that's the other big a difficulty. And a good example of that is oh, we're always improving Bodhinyana Monastery or Jhana Grove Retreat Center, just you know where I hang out. You know, all these years that you know, we've been building places, people ask you, oh, when's, when's your monastery going to be finished? <laughs> it's, it's never finished. When is the Buddhist Fellowship Singapore going to finish their own property two years three years four years well that sort of may be but in reality it will never be finished it will look finished to many people but you know there's always more can be done to improve it so how can you ever get any rest and this is this wonderful story which i heard when i was a young monk from this uh, monk in thailand buddha dasa bhikkhu very sort of unique monk. And he was the one who was building his hall at, during the rains retreat. This is the rains retreat now. And well, during the rains retreat, uh, well, when it started, the hall wasn't finished. No roof on, no glass in the windows and rubbish all over the floor. And this visitor came to ask, when is, when is 
your hall going to be finished? And he gave this wonderful answer. The hall is finished. What, said the, the person who asked the question, you know, there's so much more to be done. Yeah, but not now. It's our range retreat. We're resting, relaxing. So, well, 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 what do you say it's finished? And then this monk very beautifully said, and it's words I always remember, what's done is finished. And then he went off to meditate. In your life, when is your work finished? What's done is finished. So you appreciate not what's there to be done, not what you have to do tomorrow morning, what you've done today. You appreciate that gives you so much joy and satisfaction. You realize, yes, I can relax. I've done a lot of work today, done good things. Marvelous, well done. You don't always look at what's left to be done. Same with the Buddhist Fellowship. My goodness, you've done a huge amount of great work over this, the last 20 years or 22 or three years when I've known you. Amazing. Yeah, of course, there's lots more to be done. A new center for yourself. It's wonderful. But don't worry about it all night. Otherwise, that you'll lose a lot of sleep and you wonder, what's, what's the Buddhist Fellowship there for? Just give you more stress. Now it's there to heal that stress. A way of building where you don't building or constructing or raising funds 24 7. Today, how much funds you've raised, wonderful. Tomorrow, raise some more. But not all the time. Because sometimes I know that I, I have to track, uh, check myself in this. Because I'm always raising funds for something. But you're not raising funds. That's not the main reason you're doing anything. You're doing this to actually to, to heal people's pain and suffering, to give them a good uh, direction in life, good meaning in life, some kindness. It's the process is always more important than goals. It's how we get there rather than reaching that goal. Because that goal is never reached in the sense of, worldly achievements is reached inside and the understanding of how life works and how if you really want to have beautiful centers you do it well from inside the beautiful centers reflect the beautiful people who made it contributed made it happen it's a reflection of them so you don't have gaudy centers you have centers which are practical where people can find out that the, the way to actually construct a community, the community is the most important part of that. I often notice, because I was brought up in a Western system, you know, the churches, the churches are the halls where the Christians gather. But that's actually not the original meaning of the word church. The original meaning of the word church was the congregation, the people. That was the original meaning of the word church, a group of people doing their religious worship. Only later on, it started to mean the buildings, not the people inside of them. And after a while, just the buildings became so ornate, so big, there's no people inside. I used to go to some of those beautiful churches and inside, no one was there said, where's the church? It's the stone and the, the roof and everything. I said, that's not the church. The church is the people, which is one of the reasons why when you're building a new center, always remember the people who are going to be inside that. They're the more, most important, which means that, you know, when you've worked enough today, put it down, rest, and pick it up tomorrow morning. It's a long journey, but... You get there in the end. And they're even building Bodhinyana Monastery here. For 38 years I've been here. I figured out the other day. And when I first arranged a retreat, we just, you know, we had hardly anything. And I slept in. <laughs> for my, my hut for the range retreat was half a water tank. We cut it in half. That was the roof. And put some old railway sleepers 
you know, underneath that, we found an old door and that was it. <laughs> That's where I slept for the first range retreat. <laughs> really simple. Well, now I'm in a nice hut and a beautiful cave. So I've gone up in the world, something, some say the other, you're living in a cave, my goodness. But little by little, we build, we develop, make it better, but always remember where we started. Remember where we started. We understand that this is a beautiful thing we're doing. But it's the way we do it is the most important. That's the most beautiful. So little by little, we and it's incredible. I mean, Pang Hong, you were saying that you had a little place you were uh, thinking of getting, but somebody else bought it. That means it's you know, it wasn't meant to be. And I've got a lot of faith in this you know, system like of heavenly beings. You're seeking a place for the Buddhist fellowship. Do some chanting. You know how to chant. And to ask the heavenly beings in Singapore to assist you. You think that Ajahn Brahm's gone crazy in his old age. You know, it's just, I always do this. And when it's the right place, you know it. Everything falls into place. But in Yohana Monastery, we wanted to get another place at first. And similarly, we, you know, we all decided we we're going to get it, and then somebody bought it before we even put an offer in. We lost that place because that wasn't the right place. This, you know, here in Serpentine, this was the right place. You felt it when you get there. For our Dhammasara Nansa Monastery. <laughs> a crazy place. No way we, could we afford it. We bought it anyway. <laughs> we find out. It's just so heavenly beings were there for us. So often this happens. And so it should also happen in Singapore. You keep looking. When the right place comes, you'll know it. But do the chanting first of all. Make sure that you know that some heavenly beings are on your side, and then it comes, and you get it, and it's inspiring. So it is. Uh, how we actually do that? Some peace, equanimity, some rest. Build up your powers. It's not just bought with money. But with much more than that, some of the stuff which I um, if I had a, a financial advisor, he would just uh, sack me by now. Some of the stuff which I've committed to, people, you can't do that. How are you going to pay for it? How are you going to raise money for it? <laughs> Always do. Always manage to find it somehow. In some really weird ways. I often tell people for even Dhammasara Monastery, you know, the Aunt Bikuni's monastery. Just <laughs> crazy. No way we could afford something like that. But then just this fellow came. He wanted to see me. And he, you know, he was an Aussie man. And he said he was a Buddhist. I've never seen him before in his life. And he said that uh, his wife had just given birth to her First, the first son in the family, no, so the first daughter in their family, just given birth to a daughter. He was a Buddhist. And he said, the chances that my daughter wants to become a Buddhist nun is pretty low. But I want her to have the choice. If she wants to be, I want her to be a Buddhist monastery for nuns close by for her. I hear you're, you're building one. So we're not really building it yet. We haven't bought it yet. He said, well, I want to help you buy the land. And he gave me one of the biggest checks I've ever received in my life, 250000 Australian dollars. And the check was like that. I've never seen it before. And I must admit, I was shaking a little bit because I was excited. And there's things like that, which is how these things happen. So the inspiration, which equanimity starts to provide. Equanimity is where you find peace and energy and this incredible stuff which happens in life. So little by little, we develop more equanimity. And of course, sometimes things don't work out the way you want it to. You don't get your preferred property at first. It's always because it's not meant to be. 
It wasn't supposed to happen. I've got a lot of trust and faith that good people, good things happen to them. It's called the law of karma. So little by little, you work hard, you put the word out, you raise funds. It's never enough. Never enough. It doesn't matter. You make it enough. Little by little, people get inspired. And that inspiration is sometimes what matters. So many times that, you know, when people are trying to, to achieve things, achieve the impossible, when people have got addictions, and then they get through those addictions. Well, please excuse me again, but I got this wonderful card this morning about a person overcoming addiction. I, I, please excuse me, I'm just going to read it to you. It's just in my drawer here. Yes, is it? This was from a, a lady in Queensland. I won't say her name. But anyway, I liked, dear Ajahn Brahm, I liked this little card she sent out of gratitude. I like to start with the story of how your audio book came to me and has changed my life and perspective of my world. My dear friend, I won't say the name, had told me that someone else, a psychologist, who specializes in trauma, whom I proceeded to visit regularly to unpack the loss of my partner to suicide, along with childhood trauma that led me to alcohol abuse and other unhealthy coping patterns. She had mentioned your teachings, that's Ajahn Brahm's teachings, and I'd had your name saved in my phone for many months. For some reason, one particular day, I decided to listen to one of your talks. I was taken by your great sense of humor, I'm glad that somebody appreciates my bad jokes <laughs> and ability to convey such profound insights with simplicity. A few days later, I was in the car with my friends, telling them about you when my friend said, oh, yes, Ajahn Brahm, he's wonderful. I have his audio book in the boot of my car. I'll lend it to you. So that is how I began listening to opening the door of your heart in my car. I'd only listened to a few of those stories when I encountered a situation that nearly led me to go back down my old path of addiction. But your story of how thinking about doing something is usually the hardest part, unless you're doing it is easy. Think about it is the hardest part. With this fresh in my mind, I did the right thing and threw the substance in the bin. It was a powerful and moving experience and I continued to grow and change. I can't say how many people I've shared your story with about the two bricks, but it is a lot in capital letters. That one in particular really struck at, uh, struck at, uh, at me. As my whole life, I'd been looking at what was wrong, not good enough in relation to myself and others and the world. No wonder I was filled with fear anxiety and depression and thinking what's wrong with others and me. I am very proud to say that I am now over nine months sober. Yeah, well done, this lady. The longest ever in my life. But not only that, my whole life has changed to become more positive, meaningful and awake. I would like to thank you with all my heart for sharing your life-changing wisdom to the world. I hope that my humble donation, she sent a hundred bucks, will help to continue the priceless works and service yourself and your monks carry on, including Buddhist fellowship. The door of my heart, the door of my home and to my heart is always open to you. Thank you again, Ajahn Brahm. Take care. That's what the Buddhist fellowship does. That's why when you have a, a more convenient place, which you own, why the teachings, which not just me, but then Rappensara and all the others who teach there, they can share with others. That's how powerful these things are. That's why when I read that this morning, when I opened the letter, I thought, wow, maybe I should share this with everybody here. You're not just building just a place for Buddhist fellowship. It's not just to show off just how big you are or how wonderful my temple is. My temple is bigger than your temple. Nah, 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 nah. It's just to show just how powerful this whole 
teaching is and how you make it more readily available for everybody. And it's little stories like that, which, you know, they touch my heart as well, to show just how this, these teachings which we give on how to be equanimous, to rest, relax, and see the truth, and to get rid of a lot of problems, even physical problems. Oh, here we go with physical problems. Every year we have people coming from our local cancer groups come and just listen to a talk here or, or I go over to their place and give talks. And it's one of the reasons is these attitudes and meditation practice was really powerful. It's so powerful that it cures these cancers. It's a pretty big claim to make, but it does. I've seen it too many times. It's something when you can relax your body, get equanimity in your body. Don't be afraid all the time. Don't be negative. And you find that that way, the body has a chance to heal. It's not being apathetic. Oh, I'm going to die anyway. What's the matter? And that means a very painful death, unpleasant. With equanimity, you make peace with things. Make deep peace with what you're experiencing. When you do stuff like that, oh, you feel just things change. And of course, I know that personally. <laughs> I don't really, I, I'm usually in very, very good health. How come? Even recently, the last time I felt sick, about a couple of months ago, that just after lunch, went back into my cave. I felt, oh, this is, you know, something's wrong here. I felt, you know, getting a bit of a fever. You know, getting a bit sort of sneezy and coffee and just really feeling sort of, you know, that there's a sickness coming. Didn't know what, I don't care what. What I always do, I just have peace with it, equanimity. I just go into it peacefully with kindness. But honestly, I just, uh, I've done this so many times, but every time it just inspires me. This is like Dhamma in action, personal action. I can't sort of uh, video it and show it to you. It's uh, inside of me. But you feel whatever there was a cause of that sickness which was coming on, that just the meditation just relaxed it, relaxed it so much. The equanimity was my medication. Together with the kindness, I have to add the kindness. And then everything relaxed so much, the body did whatever it needed to heal itself. And after 10 or 15 minutes, I was just meditating <laughs> in deep happiness. <laughs> That's what happens. When you know that that personal experience, that's truth. You teach it to others and to some of the others, it really works. You realize that what this practice, what we have here, is invaluable. We should never keep it in just in a small room, just with a few of our friends. We shouldn't keep it in a rented center. In the year I was building. I know it costs a lot of money, but it's worthwhile. And many people donate thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions to things like cancer research. This is really effective. Learning how to relax your own body, to have equanimity with it, and to heal so much stuff. And even equanimity to your status in life. I just was going to finish off with the simile when in mental health, you know, the time when I gave this talk at, for the clients of the mental health system here in Australia, in our local convention centre in Perth, and going in there and just seeing all these people who had had lots of trauma, depression, uh, all the other sort of stuff, which I don't know all the names, and just telling them that, you know, you're, you're all damaged. I didn't like that. Where's, where's he going with this? You're all damaged goods. We're trying to cure ourselves. So don't try and cure yourselves. You're damaged. You've got all these so-called uh, imperfections. And then I gave them that wonderful simile of the trees in the forest. It's one of my favourite similes. I maybe say it too much, but I, I, I get inspired by it. 
I live in a forest. I lived all my monastic life in forests, jungles, rainforests. This is Aussie forest. And when you walk in a forest, I've never, ever seen a perfect tree. Not a tree which is straight, with all the limbs, all the branches in the right place, all green leaves and no brown leaves or yellow leaves or leaves being eaten by the bugs. Here in the Aussie forests in Australia, they've all got uh, burn marks because, you know, that's the fires which go through. And they're all damaged goods. Damaged by the fires, damaged by the bugs, damaged by the droughts or the storms. And they're all beautiful. And I said that if you're damaged goods, twisted and bent, you belong. Like the trees in the forest, you belong. You're one of us. We'll never reject you, stigmatize you. You belong. And number two, if you're really damaged, you've had a really hard time in your life, you're twisted and bent and burnt and marked. You're some of the most beautiful trees in the forest. They're the ones I like the most. The ones I like to have my photograph taken with. Bent, twisted all over the place. Marks on your, your trunk. And that's where the, the birds and the animals make their nests. <laughs> You're so important. And I had most of the audience crying. Because instead of trying to cure themselves, they started valuing themselves. They're important. They cared for themselves. And that's the sort of teachings which I got from an Ajahn Chah from the Buddha. Oh, they're powerful. They really work. I've seen that, and you've seen that as well, many of you. have seen that in your own lives. You don't need to write the little messages to me. And you see, just it's really worthwhile. In equanimity, you're content with all your scars, with all your traumas. You've taken all that, what I kept on calling the truck, truckloads of dung. You've taken all the truckloads of dung. You've dug them in and made a beautiful garden for yourself. That is how Buddhism works. That is how the Dharma. Don't change people. You love them. You care for them. And you have this beautiful sense of contentment with Ajahn Brahm's old bad jokes. <laughs> Other people's ways of saying this and saying that. And just welcome. You make peace with life and peace with yourself. That's what the Buddhist fellowship is there for. So may it grow, have a beautiful center, and a place where we can spread these teachings more widely, more comfortably to more people for the benefit of the whole world. Basically, the Singapore government, if they really realize just the power of these teachings, the power of the Buddhist fellowship, they should be subsidizing it to the max. Doesn't matter. <laughs> they will learn one day. Thank you for listening. Sadhu. 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 Thank you, Ajahn, for the lovely talk. Uh, let's open questions. Uh, first, we have a question here that, uh, Dear Ajahn, many thanks for the informative Dhamma talk. May I ask, an acquaintance friend stricken with cancer asked to meet up for a talk. How may I talk to her so that she doesn't feel that I'm being indifferent to her illness or situation when I'm actually equanimous? Thank you. Yep. Also be kind. So equanimity, if it really is contentment, it creates some happiness inside of you, some energy inside of you. And that equanimity comes out 
in this beautiful kindness, the smile. Apathy has got no smile at all. Horizontal mouth. <laughs> I can't keep that. That's apathy. But really equanimity has got a smile on his face as well. It creates energy inside of you. And that energy inside of you of kindness. You've got enough energy to serve and help others. And when you go and see your friend who has cancer, remember, it's only part of her has cancer. Don't see Mrs. Cancer. See the person. And I was taught that years and years ago by this Buddhist nun. This is an Australian nun. This is Mahayana. No, she was Vajrayana, you nun. But, you know, just she really valued me. <laughs> she was the one when she was dying of cancer. And she called me up. One day before she died, she said, look, I'm going. I'm, I really need to see you. I said, yeah, sure. So I went to go and see her. And the nurse would not let me in her room. I said, no, you can't go in there. I said, why did you just call me up? She wants to see me. She said, nope, we've got to respect our patient's wishes. And she was the woman, because on the door, she, the nurse grabbed me. You know, she didn't grab a monk, but she grabbed me and dragged me to the door. And sure enough, there was a big sign on the door, which the nun had written herself. Absolutely no visitors. <laughs> and as the nurse said, see, absolutely no visitors. We must respect our patient's wishes. I always inspect things, you know, that's part of my job as a monk. I always have a look. And sure enough, at the bottom, there was a small print. <laughs> a small print. I don't make this up. This is true. A small print read, except for Ajahn Brahm. <laughs> I said, see, I'm allowed in. The nurse was very upset. And I was smiling and laughing. And I, when I asked the, the woman, that the nun who was dying, why did you write that? Because everybody who comes to see me, all my friends and relations, my loved ones, they just talk about my cancer. I've had enough of that. I want to talk about other things in life. What's your latest joke, Ajahn Brahm? <laughs> so we just had this wonderful time just talking about some Dhamma, but not just focusing on one thing. When you go and see that woman, don't just focus on her cancer. She knows that. There's more to life. And sickness and dying. And of course, this, this nun, she died the next day, that night. She was correct. She knew she was going. She just wanted a bit of energy, some positivity. Not just people who are just so afraid of sickness. They just won't let you go and they don't treat you like an old person. They stigmatize you. You're the cancer lady. Oh, what is a cancer lady? the cancer man, even more than that. So speak to the other part of the person, not just the cancer. Thank you, Ajahn. Another question is, is it true that without suffering, people are in denial on, of the Four Noble Truths and the Three Marks of Existence? Normally, they feel fine with abundance in this lifetime and I'm able to relate with people who is suffering, be it mentally or physically. <laughs> oh, yes, I know there's people say that. But, you know, they have maybe lots of money, and on the outside they look like, oh, they're happy and they're having a good time. But really, are they? Look, Eileen, well, whoever asked that question, I'm going to ask you, Eileen. Who is one of the happiest but poorest people you've ever met? <laughs> a jug bra. Thank you. I've got no money. I live in a cave. Nothing on the floor. This is my workplace here. I've got no secretary to, to help me. And I've got no money in the bank. Oh, no credit card or no superannuation, no pension. <laughs> I've got nothing. I've got no car. Nothing. So, so sometimes when you understand what happiness really is, you understand people have got a lot. They don't know what happiness is at all. And sometimes when you go to their homes and they just relax and show you what they really like, they have a huge amount of suffering. They work so hard to get funds, money, big house. That's nowhere near enough. They have loneliness. They have fear because whenever someone visits them, 
They feel they're going to ask for a donation or ask for some money or something, ask for a loan. And they're very lonely, rich people, because of fear. As for me, I'm not lonely at all. I've got no fear. You can come and ask me for something, and if I've got something, I'll give it to you. I'll give them all my cup <laughs> for that auction. <laughs> I would just, I'd go into my cave, you know, after having lunch and find a few things missing. They're being auctioned. <laughs> I, I don't know what I own. So anyway, if you want it, you can have it. <laughs> Even this beanie. Think it's about my third beanie this week. Someone said, oh, that's a nice beanie. I said, okay, it's yours. I'll give it to them. <laughs> See, I really am bored under this. I haven't, got, haven't even got any hair. So that way you realise that I know because I've met many wealthy people and they really become honest with you. And they say that they thought that getting all this money was all they needed in the world to be happy. They're supposed to be successful. They go on the uh, talk shows or something, but really underneath, they're not that happy at all. Their relationships, their family, it's very, very tense. So real happiness comes from your friendships, your giving, you feel you're doing something in the world. You're not just having money. That doesn't protect you. Friends do. And that's my investment. I'm very wealthy in the amount of people who care for me. Look, uh, many of you may have seen that video on my birthday, 70th birthday. I had nothing to do with that. It was a wonderful little surprise sitting down there and all these old friends and people saying all these nice things about me. Usually you have to wait till you die before you get such lovely eul eulogies. <laughs> I got it all before I died. We're all these wonderful people. And that was that friendship there, that service. And that makes me actually very rich. Not in money. I can't give a donation to the Buddhist Fellowship for building the hall or the new centre, whatever it is. But I can give all of my energy, as much as you want. And that sort of makes me rich. Friendship, service. I'm not afraid of anything. I often say that when I go to Singapore, and I'm sure I'll go there one day, not to the future, uh, when COVID with that, COVID in West Australia, no one got COVID or no one's sort of dangerous with COVID in, in West Australia, but still we can't go anywhere. Anyway, that will change. But anyway, just that's one thing which I'm never worried about. I never have insurance. Well, I don't know if I should tell you this. When I go overseas, I don't have insurance. I don't need it. The reason is, if I got sick when I went to Singapore, if I got some sort of broken leg or something, there'd be many, many people there who would be sort of kind of happy. Mm -hmm. They have a chance to keep me in Singapore longer. <laughs> and look after me. Good merit. Yes, we're going to do some merit. Come on, I'll break a leg when you're in Singapore. Don't break your leg when you're Mala in Malaysia. Please break your leg when you're in Singapore. Then we can look after you. <laughs> Thank that's, you. That's what wealth is. Dear Ajahn, I think this question is from one of the ex -course. Thank you for the wonderful talk. What chance should we do for the blessings of the divine beings in our endeavors? <laughs> First of all, to respect those divine beings. I'm a theoretical physicist. Those beings exist. We can tell lots of stories about them. But also, for those of you who did see that lovely video I just mentioned, one of the people in there was uh, my old friend Bernard, Bernard Carr from Cambridge. He just said his burner from Cambridge. People didn't know. You know. He was one of the very close associates of Stephen Hawkins. He was one of my mates you know, when we were studying together. And he was such in the inner circle, maybe the close three or four students of Stephen Hawkins. You know, that professor, you know, Mr. Black, not the Black Holes, but uh, Big Bang. You know, that's a big scientist. And so... People didn't realize just how powerful Stephen Hawkins is. 
Well, about how powerful Bernard Carr is. And he was also the president of the Psychic Research Society. We went ghost hunting together. So even though he is a top physicist, he still knows about things like spirits, other beings, and just how. You know, if it's something inspiring, something good, not just so you can be rich and win the lotto, something which is inspiring, like uh, a good center for Buddhists. And as you know, the Buddhist fellowship is unique. It doesn't do what other temples do. It actually teaches as people meditating, as people do wonderful things like, you know, I remember the old tsunami project, which I got involved in years and years ago. Great, great jobs you're doing there. Let people know what you're doing. Let the neighbors know what you're doing. Let the government know what you're doing. You're doing a great service. And little by little, heavenly beings and other beings, they will be of service to you. So first of all, respect those beings. And it doesn't matter what chant you're actually doing, the actual words of the chant aren't as important as the feelings in your heart when you do that chant. And it gives you a lot of success. Even the chant which I did for you, the Victory Project Protection, that's a nice one. But Jayanto Bodhi Amure. The Buddha, just one person sitting under a Bodhi tree in the middle of nowhere changed the whole world. You know, think about that, that victory there over defilements, over Mara, over delusion. One person did so much and it's still, he's still carrying on. Or rather the echoes of his life still moving people throughout the whole world. That's powerful. And so heavenly beings will really respect that. And of course, they will want to help those who respect them. Thank you, Ajahn. Another question. Dear Boss Monk. <laughs> yes. I'm meditating for three years and more now. Honestly, I've been losing mot mot motivation to meditate for some time. Could you give me the motivation for me to start again? And since Ajahn is on a range retreat, please give us a big chant that uh, expired. When Ajahn is out from Rain's retreat. <laughs> <laughs> no, look, if you meditate the right way, it's not about motivation. It's about stopping, being still. Meditation is the easiest thing in the world to do. But you don't do anything. What can be easier than sit down there and learning how to be content? even though the trees are all bent and crooked. They're lovely like that. You, in this moment, however you are, whatever you're feeling, however your body is, sick or healthy, whatever, be content in this moment. Contented and easily satisfied. Then you find your mind automatically becomes peaceful. The reason why people just get a bit disappointed with their meditation is they try and do things. And when you're doing something, it's never enough. Try something else. Learn how to be here. Be content. Equanimous. Allow things to be. With no goal, no measuring. And wait. In this moment, make peace. Be kind. And be gentle. And you find that some mind gets so peaceful it surprises you. Yeah, you may get sleepy for a few times. But that's just the brain catching up. But then after a while, the mind just gets so peaceful. So energized. Wow. But please remember, you didn't do it. Meditation happens when you're not doing anything. When you are not doing anything. Thank you, Ajahn. Another meditation question. Yeah, Ajahn, why 
sometimes when I meditate, I feel frustration and anger coming out. Okay, it's great it's coming out. It shouldn't be in the first place. So let, let it come out. Why, when you're washing, does the dirt come out? Why, when you blow your nose, all this yucky stuff comes out? Let it come out. Now, this is a type of meditation which is part of you know, ordinary meditation, but you focus on this, and goodness, it works so well. Again, sometimes I get tired. I'm an old monk, and sometimes I do too much. So sometimes when I sit down to meditate, my legs are aching, tummy is a bit stiff. What do I do? I don't get frustrated. I don't get angry because I go towards her. That's my teacher. I learned this from Ajahn Chah. Now, when we tried to ask him, can we please have some mosquito netting so we don't need to be so bit bitten you know, by all the mozzies in Thailand? He said, no. He said, from now on, that you call those mosquitoes Ajahn Mosquito. Mosquitoes are your teacher. I thought I was just being tough, but my goodness, I was so deep. And so any ache or pain which I have, that's my teacher. And I respect my teachers. So if I get anything, emotional, physical, whatever ache or pain in the body or the mind, I let it be. Let it teach me. It's right here in this moment. It's real. This is Dhamma. It may be not the Dhamma of a talk. It may not be inspiring you know, to have like a big ache in the, the head or anywhere. But it's here. And I make peace with it because I want to listen to it. I don't want to get rid of it. I want to care for it. It's teaching me something. It's my Ajahn. And I do that to anything. When I do that, this is honest, this is my practice, this is how I meditate. When I do that, you go right into the feeling or the whatever it is, the tiredness, the ache, the pain, whatever. You go right inside of it with kindness. It just vanishes. I don't do it in order to make it vanish. If I try that, it doesn't vanish. I go right, because it's my teacher. When I've learned my lesson, when I graduate, I don't need to go to school again. So, you know, in your meditation, if you get anything like upset, anger, frustration, wonderful. That's your teacher. So allow it to be. Go inside of it. Learn from it. And when it disappears, it means you've learned your lesson. It doesn't come back again. Thank you, Ajahn. Someone commented that if Ajahn doesn't have a chance to read or answer your message, please get Ajahn's book titled The Art of Disappearing with Metta. Oh, yeah. That, I, I've just taken that from my shelf often to the, for the monks because I like the preface there. The preface is a wonderful preface. <laughs> and that preface and the art of disappearing. Uh, can I read that out as well? Yeah, sure. Yeah, okay. <laughs> The art of disappearing. Because when I they wanted the preface from the book over in the United States, and so I, I wrote this in about five or ten minutes, honestly, just scribbled it down, and I thought I should just a bit of fun and games, and, so, and I sent it to them, emailed it to them, and then they, I with a note saying you probably don't like this, yeah, but but I'll send something a bit more serious afterwards. And they emailed back, no, we want this. <laughs> the preface to the art of disappearing. Do not read this book if you want to be a somebody. <laughs> it will make you a nobody and no self. I did not write this book. They are transcribed talks edited with all the bad jokes removed. I did not say my bad jokes anyway. The five candors which presumptuously claim to be me, said them. I have the perfect alibi. Myself was absent from the scene of the crime. This book does not tell you what to do to get enlightened. It is not an instruction manual like Mindfulness, Bliss and Beyond, 
which was also written by those five candidates pretending to be Ajahn Brahm, doing things like following instructions just makes you more of a person. Instead, this book describes how disappearing happens in spite of you. Moreover, it is not just outside that vanishes. The entire inside, all that you take to be you, that also disappears. And that is so much fun, it is sheer bliss disappearing. The true purpose of practicing Buddhism is to let go of everything, not to get more things like attainments to show off to your friends. When we let go of something, really let go, then it disappears. We lose it. All successful meditators, all successful meditators are losers. Mm -hmm. They lose their attachments. Enlightened ones lose everything. They truly are the biggest loser, enlightened ones. At the very least, if you read this book, The Art of Disappearing, if you read this book and understand some of it, you may discover the meaning of freedom. And as a consequence, lose all the hair on your head. <laughs> I, acknowledge, I acknowledge I acknowledge the kind the kind assistance of other nobodies. In particular, one story for transcribing the talks, Ajahn Brahmali, he's always involved in these things, Ajahn Brahmali for editing the work, and all the empty beings at wisdom publications in US for publishing the book. May you all get lost. <laughs> <laughs> that's good fun, but that's actually very deep stuff. Yes. May you all get lost. We always want to get somewhere, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> want to be somebody. Instead, we go the opposite direction. Thank you, Ajahn. <laughs> do the last, uh, last two requests. Any, anyone on the floor would like to ask something? No? Going? Going? Okay, the last uh, two questions. One is a uh, request for the bad joke of the day. <laughs> okay, you asked for it. <laughs> okay, this is, uh, I'll try this one. Don't know if you've heard this one. A woman has lost her arm. She's only got one arm left. Where does she go shopping? Answer, in the second hand shop. <laughs> second hand shop. That's a good one. Okay, very good. You asked for it. It's a bad joke. <laughs> Okay, the last question for today. Ajahn, yeah. I'm coming to Singapore in December, someone <laughs> asked. Yeah, basically, the future is uncertain. I haven't got a clue. But I do know that, you know, the, with things like COVID, you know, it changes all the time. I've had my two vaccinations. So, you know, I'm supposed to be immune. But... You know, sometimes government regulations and stuff. I don't know how it's changing. But if it's possible, I'll come. Because, you know, sometimes uh, it's nice to hear one another uh, on over Zoom. And it's nice to sort of uh, see pictures of one another. But you know it's never the same as actually being face-to-face -face contact. And I know that because uh, why is it that when these celebrities or big bands. Now, why did, why did they go to the trouble of performing live in Singapore? And the reason is because being live, face-to-face, -face, is something else happens. It's not just the words. It's not just the expressions. It's not just the bad jokes. There's always something else happens as well. And that's also really important. For me, it was really important actually to live with Ajahn Chah, to see him. That made a lot of difference to the practice. It made it come alive. 
So I really feel I do need to uh, somehow or other, one day, make sure that I see you all again live. You don't have to wait until you get a sensor. I mean, get someplace or whatever, or just in the park. Or in the, I've, I asked this when I first came to Singapore, why don't we get Singapore National Stadium? <laughs> <laughs> they won't give it to us. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> anyway, when it can happen, it will happen. And it will happen. Just a matter of just uh, waiting, being patient. And then these okay. things will happen. Great, Ajahn. Okay, so let's uh, uh, request Ajahn for a blessing as well as just do a, sh a short sharing of marriage before we do our own closing. Okay, I'll do the blessing first of all. And this is trying to send a blessing, especially to the Davis of Singapore. Thank you, Ajahn. And make sure that they all come on board and just help out because it's about time. It's nice to have a really beautiful center there and a place where you can meet together and uh, expand these great teachings. So here we go. Sabadanubhavena <laughs> Sabadamanubhavena. Saba Sangha Nubhavena Buddha Ratanang Dhamma Ratanang Sangha Ratanang Tinang Ratananang Anubhavena Chaturasiti Sahasa Dhamma Kanda Nubhavena Pitakataya Nubhavena Jina Sawaka Nubhavena Sabe te roga, sabe te baya, sabe te antaraya, sabe te upadawa, sabe te dunimita, sabe te awa mangala vina santu ayu vada ko dana vada ko siri vada ko yasa vada ko bala vada ko vana vada ko sukha vada ko hotu sabada dukha roga bhaya vira so kasa tu chu pada wa ane kanta raya piwina san tu cha te cha sa jaya si di danang la bang so ti baga yang su kang balang siri ayu cha wa no cha bo gang wu di cha yasa wa sa ta wa sa cha ayu cha ji va si di ba wan tu te. That's for all the neighbors, all the human beings, everybody in Singapore. <laughs> Excellent. And now to sharing of merits, Yidang Main Yati Nang Hotu. Yes, okay. Yidang Main, please chant with me. Yidang Main Yati Nang Hotu Sukita Hon Tu Yata Yo. Yidang Main Yati Nang Hotu Sukita Hon Tu Yata Yo. Ida main yati nang ho tu sukita hon tu yata yo. Okay, thank you, Ajahn. Before we close, let's pay our respects to Ajahn before we say bye to Ajahn and do our own closing. Very good. First bow. Second bow. Third bow. Very good. Thank you, Ajahn. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. <laughs> one, one of the retreats, uh, we will see you soon. Yes, we'll do. Bye. Bye. Bye, Ajahn. Bye, Ajahn. Okay, let's do our closing. Oh, we have announcements. Okay, announcements first. Okay, so you know, help build
our Dharma home or your Dharma home. So uh, you have uh, the slides here for pay now, bank transfer, cash, nets, check, monthly gyro, or go to the bfdharmahome.org website and you have the whole list of uh, things to sponsor. Dharma Foundation course is starting next month, the first week of September to the 18th of December. All our on-site places have been taken up. So there's only Zoom available. So do sign up if you are joining us. Um, for September, we have Ajahn Brahmali uh, next, next week. Uh, and then we have uh, Bhante Gunaratana, uh, who's talking about karma, and Angie uh, Chiu, who is uh, here, but there's no recording, so do come in person, on site only. And uh, of course, our sister Sylvia Bay uh, in the last week of December, uh, September. Uh, Ajahn Brahmali will speak on Was Buddha a Hindu? So do join us on site as well as uh, live stream. Uh, BF Youth and the Indonesian Service, we have uh, uh, next week will be Introduction to Economity by Bante Frank. All these are on Zoom. And uh, except for one of the workshops, which will be at BF East, do look at the poster outside uh, or uh, on our website. Indonesian service, uh, they, they have it on the third and fourth week of the month. So do look out for it as well. Anapanasati meditation, those who have registered for the previous um, classes, uh, uh, thank you for answering back the emails with that, whether you are attending or not. So we have only a few places left for those um, who would like to register. 5th September as well, it starts uh, uh, this uh, on every Sunday, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Okay, no class on the 19th of September. So it's a six session course. For our BF Junior Youth, ages 13 to 16, Saturday 3 to 5 p.m., the whole uh, list, they are doing Zoom at the moment. Uh, every week, uh, do come and join them for those who are uh, students aged 13 to 16. Rahula Connects for the BF Juniors, age 7 to 9 and 10 to 12. Upper primary will be on the 5th of September and lower primary 19th of September. Do join in the Zoom uh, online. We are starting Yin Yoga at BF East on site um, from 21st September to 23rd November. Do sign up for uh, on, on Eventbrite. And uh, I think the payment is through the teacher. Thank you, next. Okay, we have, now we are really sharing merits uh, with uh, two uh, persons who have just uh, left us. Madam Eng Sing Kwan, uh, who passed away on the 3rd of August. And Madam Chan Beng Yi, who passed away on the 7th of August. Uh, let's share merits with our all sentient beings as well as uh, the two who have uh, just passed away. Let us invite all sentient beings to participate in our quiet merits. Etavata cha amhehi sambatang punya sampadang Sabbe deva anumodantu Sabba sampati siddhya Etta vata cha amhehi Sambatang punya sampadang 
Sabbe Bhuta Anumodantu Sabbe Sampatti Siddhiya Etta Vata Cha Amhehi Sambatang Punya Sampadang Sabbe Satta Anumodantu Sabbe Sampatti Siddhiya let us dedicate the merits of participating in this wholesome Dharma activity to our departed relatives and friends. Idang minyati dang ho tu sukita hon tu nyatayo. Idang minyati dang ho tu sukita hon tu nyatayo. Idang minyati nang ho tu sukita hon tu nyatayo. End of service dedication. I dedicate the merits which I have accumulated to the cultivation of my mind in order to bring happiness and benefits to all sentient beings. I dedicate the merits to my parents, children, spouse, relatives, friends, colleagues, and I am adversaries, wishing them long life, good health, happiness, and prosperity. May we never part from the triple gem, and may we always walk the path towards enlightenment. Let us pay respects to the triple gem. Arahan Sama Sam Buddha Bhagawa Buddha Bhagawan Tang Abiwa Demi Swakato Bhagawata Dhammo Dhammang Namasami Supatipano Bhagavato Savaka Sango Sangang Namami Sadu Sadu Sadu. Thank you, brothers and sisters, for joining us today. We hope uh, everyone have a good week. Uh, those, uh, and I'd uh, like to thank also Brother Pang Hong and uh, Brother Tai Vi for leading the EXCO and the website team. Uh, thank you very much. Let's, uh, oh, I'm uh, reminded that next week it's 3 p.m. as well uh, for Ajahn Brahmali's talk. So not in the morning. See you all at 3 p.m. Thank you.